for joining us on another one of these uh, market live streams. Uh, try to come to you every Monday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, get you ready for the uh, stock market this week. Let you know all the stock market news, the trends, the strategies, and the stocks I'm watching. Uh, big week this week. Uh, the market closed, actually closed up 3.6% in March, which was a huge turnaround, obviously, uh, after the first two months of the year and that massive sell-off since we had, uh, since really November's peak. Uh, but the mar market was up in March. It's typically uh, up in April, up 70% of the time since, um, since World War II, and up an average of 1.7%, which, you know, I hate those little farmer's almanac kind of notes uh, on the market, you know, just because April is typically an up month or, or up an average percentage. What the hell does that say, really? You know, that that tells me nothing other than, okay, if there is some kind of seasonality or cyclicality to it, then that's fine. And you can look to that. But don't just don't just invest because, oh, this month is usually better than this month. Actually put some reasoning behind it. Uh, but we are getting started to uh, to a good month. It looks like uh, futures are going to open positive uh, today. And, uh, and the stock market is, the momentum is clearly on the side of investors, right? After the, uh, the NASDAQ fell into uh, bear territory, 20% down from its peak. After the NAS or the S&P 500 fell 10% from its peak into that correction territory, uh, we, are back, uh, we are back in rally mode. And uh, we're still in that kind of that, that buy the news kind of a rebound rally after the Fed interest rate hikes. So... We're going to get started. That doesn't mean that uh, obviously stocks are going to be a roller coaster probably for the rest of the year. Uh, no longer, sorry folks, but no longer are you going to be able to get the easy 20, 30 percent returns on the stock market or on stocks like you did over the last few years. Uh, you know, the last few years, the market was just juiced to hell by the Federal Reserve. They increased their balance sheet by nine trillion dollars or by about five trillion dollars. That means they pushed money out into the economy uh, and that helped boost those asset prices. They held rates down, interest rates down to about zero. Uh, that helped at boost asset prices. And then we had all those stimulus checks from the pandemic. So a lot of factors helped stocks just go in a one way direction over the last couple of years. That's all changing right now. You know, we've got less fiscal spending this year and next. We've got obviously the Fed is raising interest rates instead of uh, keeping them lower or lowering them, and the Fed will soon start pulling back on some of that uh, some of that balance sheet uh, that it has, some of that money that it's since forced into the uh, economy over the last couple of years. It's going to start letting those bonds mature, fall off their balance sheet, and not going to be reinvesting that money. So, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, the stock market is going to fall, but it, it does mean that it's going to it's going to be kind of a limiting factor on some of these other forces. You know, we still have good consumer spending. We still have a strong economy that's going to boost stocks, but it's going to have to it's going to have to fight with some of these other factors. So that is going to be a roller coaster uh, for stocks. You need to know kind of on a month to month and a quarter by quarter basis where the market is heading. And, and really, that's what we're going to talk about. I do want to invite you to a free webinar that, that I and Thomas Carvo are doing uh, right now. You know, just because of that environment for stocks, that roller coaster environment, now is a perfect time to start understanding some of the technical signals, some of the stock signals you get from the market. Okay, you know, I'm a, I'm a long term investor, buy and hold, and a fundamental investor. I analyze those fundamentals, the balance sheets, the financial statements on stocks. But it's always good to have that technical background too, to know, okay, when are stocks over their 50-day moving average? What does that mean? Uh, when are stocks hitting the death cross? You know, something we've seen quite a bit in the news lately, the death cross stock signal. What does that mean? So if you want to uh, learn some of those and learn the top three signals that, uh, that we use, that Thomas Carvo uses uh, in his stock trading, sign up for the, uh, the webinar. I'll leave the, the link in the chat there or in the description below. Just go ahead and sign up. It's totally free uh, and we'll share those other uh, stock signals for you. I want to get started though because it does look like uh, does look like the market is going to open positive this uh, this week. We are we are about an hour before the uh, the market opens. Nasdaq futures up a third of a percent. S and P and Dow futures just up marginally. Uh, of course, you know with the with the futures up just just very s small. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a positive day or, or a day in the green. It just means, you know, on the uh, on the margin, sentiment is positive. Um, like I did, like I said, we did have uh, we we are still in that rally mode. I think 
from the uh, from the Fed interest rate hikes. Again, I think investors sold off uh, heading into those interest rates uh, into that interest rate cycle. But as, we, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of uh, really over the last month that we've been talking about this, is that stocks do well uh, when the interest rates are increasing. They do well, uh, you know, typically for a couple of years afterwards. And you really don't need to worry about uh, too much about interest rates. What happens is, and this is this is kind of the ironic part, is that investors actually sell out of their stocks as the Fed is uh, increasing rates, and even before, as we've seen over the last couple of months. Um, and that's when stocks are actually increase. That's when stock returns are actually positive. Stocks do well while the Fed is increasing rates, but then towards the end of that rate hike cycle. You know, investors start seeing that. Well, hell, we sold out of stocks, and stocks kept on going up. Maybe the uh, maybe there's something to this. They get back in stocks at exactly the wrong time, folks. Okay, because what you got to be worried about when you have to be worried about is when the stock when the Fed stops raising rates. Okay, when the Fed stops raising rates, that's a signal that the economy is starting to shift. We're getting closer to that eventual recession. And that's when stocks actually start coming down is after the Fed has stopped raising interest rates. And this is this is intuitive if you think about it. Okay, I want you to think about this uh, in kind of an put your put on your eco economist hat, right? Why does the Fed increase interest rates? Okay, it's because the Fed has two mandates. One is to keep unemployment low, but also to keep inflation low. Okay, and these are kind of conflicting, uh, you know, conflicting uh, phenomena, right? You have to balance the two off, off of each other, right? If the economy is growing very quickly, then you're going to have very low un unemployment. You have lots of jobs, lots of consumer spending. You're gonna have uh, very low unemployment, but you're gonna get higher inflation, right? You're gonna get uh, you're, you're gonna get those prices rising faster than the Fed would like. Okay. Now, conversely, if uh, you know if the if the economy is growing slower, if interest rates are high, uh, whatnot, then inflation is gonna be low. Inflation is gonna be low, but unemployment is gonna be high. Okay. So the the Fed doesn't want that either. So it has to balance this. How it balances this is with the with the interest rates. It raises or lowers uh, its own federal funds rate, its own interest rate, and that's kind of a benchmark uh, against which a lot of these other rates are set. So what the Fed does is it sees the economy overheating. It sees inflation rising. Uh, unemployment is down, is very low, is down towards historic lows. So it feels like it can raise interest rates and not destroy the economy, right? Not hurt that unemployment, that employment picture. So it increases interest rates to uh, to hit inflation. Okay. Now what does that what does that tell us? Okay, if the economy is growing very well, if unemployment is low, consumer spending is going to be high, then uh, that's good news for stocks. Okay, that is good news for corporate earnings that's good news for stocks so when the fed is raising interest rates it's typically a very good time for stocks okay think about this the other way though when the fed starts getting cautious when the fed starts saying okay you know what we've raised rates up to two or three percent uh the we are seeing the economy slow down a little bit we're seeing that inflation rate come down but we're a little bit worried that these high interest rates are now going to start hurting employment they're going to start driving unemployment up higher that's when the Fed starts uh, pausing or or stopping its interest rate hikes. And what does that mean? Okay, obviously, you know, if the economy is, is stumbling a little bit, if unemployment is going up, um, that is bad news for stocks. Okay, so if you just think about this, folks, instead of, uh, you know, running to the, the next YouTube channel or, or Yahoo Finance that says, oh my God, interest rates are going up, we're all going to die. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, is it? If you actually think about what's actually happening, why the Fed is raising interest rates. So again, don't be worried about interest rates. Don't be worried about the yield cur curve inverting either. We're going to talk about that later on in the video. A lot of news lately, especially last week, the yield curve has inverted. Oh my God, that's going to be, it's a sign of the recession. Uh, stocks are going to crash. Get out now, folks. No, it's bullshit. Again, uh, this is, this is just, this is just uh, media pundits, financial news people, and and some YouTubers looking for an excuse to make a video uh, and scare people and make sensational sensational headlines. Yes, it's true the yield curve has typically forecasted a recession, but look at the timing here, folks. Uh, recessions don't typically don't come until like 22 months. On average, it's 22 months after the yield curve inverts that we get a recession. Okay, that's almost two years, and actually uh, over the past six recessions, it has been between six months and uh, three years after the yield curve inverted that we had a uh, that we had a recession or any kind of stock market weakness, right? 
Stocks actually do very well. You know, over the past, I think it was over the past three recessions, stocks have got, have done 20 to 30% return after the yield curve inverts. Okay, so this is something we're going to talk about uh, later on. I'm going to show you the actual data on that. But just, you know, don't get don't get uh, f don't get uh, scared, panicked out of this market just because you see a, a news headline or an article or some YouTuber does a video about oh my God the yield curve is curve is inverting uh, that means you know we're all going to be broke within within a couple of days. So I want to uh, I want to get into uh, the stock market what I'm watching this week. Uh, let's look at the sectors what the sectors did uh, kind of give us that big overview picture of uh, last week and going forward here. And, uh, and of course, here we are on the sector, select sector spider, that's sectorspider.com, the sector tracker here. Uh, I'm going to click over to five days, see what the, see what the S&P 500 did last week. The S&P uh, and NASDAQ was in positive territory last week, just barely though, you know, it was, it was about three weeks uh, into that rally uh, post Fed meeting. Uh, the, the NASDAQ is up now, uh, I think something like 12%. Uh, you know, since it's uh, since it's uh, low there in March, Nasdaq was up about six tenths of a percent. S and P just barely positive last week, so it is slowing down a little bit. But I think there's still some momentum there in the markets. Uh, the S and P 500 stocks in the S and P 500 are now trading at 19.5 times uh, their earnings, their forward earnings, right, which is well under the 23 times PE we had last year, right? So ridiculously expensive last year. Not quite so much this uh, right now even after this rebound, uh, but it's still a, it's now a little bit over that 18.6 times average over the last five years. So, you know, not uh, maybe the easy money has been made after this uh, after this two or three week rebound, but the momentum is still there, I think. You know, in asset prices uh, last week, we saw oil prices crash 12 percent. Oil prices are oil is actually up three percent today to 102 gold up uh, seven tenths of a percent to nineteen hundred and thirty seven dollars an ounce. Um, Obviously, a lot of that is to do with uh, Russia and the U Ukraine. Okay, it does definitely looks like this this invasion has not gone as uh, Russia had wanted it to go, and uh, and and they're starting to kind of rethink their uh, their their strategy there. Okay, they're getting closer to talks, closer to to some kind of settlement, and that's bringing oil back down to uh, to to where it should be and where it was before the invasion. Right, uh, so we've got uh, oil right now at about one hundred two. Uh, if any kind of escalation, it could send it back up to 110 again, 115. But uh, but you know, oil. I would not be playing oil or really gold directly here, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. This is all a geopolitical thing. Very hard to uh, to forecast one way or the other. Um, gold. You know, if it took a world war, almost a world war, to send gold up almost to two thousand dollars an ounce, then uh, that's just a, a a very expensive situation uh, in my mind. If even the uh, decades high inflation that we've been getting over the last year wasn't able to do it. So uh, again, what I've been talking about over the last few weeks is instead of buying oil, instead of buying gold, I'm buying the miners as well as the explorers. You know, you've got companies like Chevron, you've got uh, companies like Devon Energy, you know, all pretty expensive right now after this this peak in uh, this oil in the oil prices, but uh, but still cash flow machines, right? Gold uh, as well. All of the gold miners operating well under that price. You know, most of the, the gold miners, the average AISC, which is the all-in sustaining cost, the price that gold miners need to be profitable, the average of that for gold miners is right around twelve, thirteen hundred dollars an ounce, right? So you've got a six, seven hundred dollar buffer. Even if gold prices come back down to that range where they were in, right around eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. Even if they come down to that point, uh, you've still got very good profitability by the gold miners. There's still going to be, uh, you know, cash flow machines putting that cash out into uh, as share buybacks as well as dividends. So I would definitely go that route rather than, uh, you know, rather than investing directly in the commodities. Uh, Bitcoin, for its part, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies uh, had a huge week uh, last week. Uh, well, up five percent last week following uh, the the prior. Prior uh, couple of weeks, up 25% since March lows, and uh, and we're talking uh, talking some more about that in a little bit. But let's look at these sectors. Uh, seven of the 11 stock sectors did close higher last week, with uh, really the rate sensitive sectors like utilities, real estate, and, and consumer staples really did the best. Uh, so what we saw is we saw the 
interest rate on the 10-year treasury come down from about 2.5% to start the week down to about 2.35, 2.37 to to end the week, right? So what you got to understand, folks, is these rate sensitive uh, sectors. And those are, again, those are things like utilities, real estate, consumer staples, and even financials here. Um, those are rate sensitive because of their dividend payments. Okay, those consumer staples, technology, or real estate and utilities. A lot of the return you're going to get from those stocks are from those dividends, right? And so that's a stable cash flow. It's kind of a, a yielding, a yielding stock, a yielding cash flow. And so a lot of times you'll see kind of a balance, a trade off uh, between interest rates and these sectors, stocks in these sectors. Okay, so if interest rates go up, then uh, investors are kind of pulled away from these sectors into fixed income, into bonds or, or other yielding interest rate yielding uh, investments, right? Uh, because they can they can now get higher rates in uh, some of these other investments. If interest rates go down, then you see them go, you see investors go back into these three stock sectors because you know then they can they can uh, create a higher return from those dividends. So of course that's kind of what we saw last week. Real estate, utilities, and consumer staples did very well last week. Uh, financials did uh, didn't do well, obviously, because uh, and this was even though long-term interest rates are doing well, are, are up by about 2.4 percent, then the shorter-term interest rates came up as well. Okay, and this is something we're going to talk about with that yield curve inversion. Uh, I still like the inter I still like the financials though. Those bank stocks. Um, I think the uh, I think the the economy is still growing. The, we're still seeing good loan demand, still consumer spending and consumer loan demand and consumer credit. And I think a lot of these financials, a lot of these bank stocks, especially, uh, could do continue to do well for the rest of the year. You know, they're going to uh, they're going to be they're trading at very low valuations right now. And, and I think that's uh, that's something you you continue to watch. So I do like the financials. Energy obviously sold off last week with that fall in oil prices. And again, this is something you have to watch for. Okay, the the oil companies, they're still going to be good cash flow machines, even if oil comes down to you know, 80, 85 dollars a barrel. Uh, but they have they've gone so far so fast this year. We can go out to the year to date so far, and financials are up 38, 39 percent so far this or energy is up 39 percent so far this year. One of only two sectors, in fact, that is in positive territory. So while you will uh, you will get those good cash flows from those uh, energy companies, even if oil comes down, you're probably going to see a little bit of a give back in these stocks. Uh, what I've done, I've actually covered a lot of my oil stocks with covered calls. That means I sell another investor a call option to to buy those from me at a certain price, at a strike price. Uh, that that way, I collect money on that investment. I still have the stock, so I collect those dividends, uh, and it reduces my risk a, a little bit, just in case oil prices do come down and some of these energy stocks come down a little bit further. I want to want to turn it over to uh, kind of some of the stuff that I'm uh, watching this week. The the stocks and what I'm watching this week. You know, folks, if, if there's anything I've learned over 20 years of investing, uh, more than 10 years as an analyst working for venture capital, private wealth management is, you know, the stock market never crashes when you expect it, okay? Never, the stock market never gonna crash when you're watching it, right? It's kind of like the boil, boiling pot, pot, right? Never boils well when you're watching it. Uh, and that's a lot, I think that's a, it's a good lesson for investors. Uh, you know, you see all these, YouTubers or uh, financial media talking about the yield curve inverting or higher interest rates and why that's a predictor of the uh, you know of a recession. And while it's true, like I said, while it's true that the yield curve has been a good predictor of inflation of recession, I think since World War II the yield curve has inverted something like 28 times, uh, and 22 of those times it's been followed by a recession. But the problem is, is the timing. Again, a timing on this. It's been, you know, an average of 22 months after that yield curve inverts uh, that we've seen a recession. So it's almost like, what does that, what does that tell me? Uh, okay, what, how does that help to be two years ahead of a recession or a stock market crash? Right, uh, you know, you're going to miss out on two years of gains. Uh, typically, those are, are very good. You know, again, 20, 30 percent even uh, sometimes uh, on average when after the yield curve inverts. So even if stocks do come down 20 or 30 percent, uh, you know, when the when we do finally get a recession, 
then you're no better than if you would have just stayed in the market, right? Because you know you stayed in the market when the yield curve inverted, you were up 20%, 30%, okay? And then you came down, you know, maybe 20, 15, 20% after that, and you're basically back to where you started anyway. So, you know, and you're missing out on the div dividends if you, uh, if you jump out, uh, out of the market there. So, you know, uh, we're going to be looking a little bit more at that data. But again, I just don't want you, you to get panicked out of this market or panicked out of stocks just because somebody says, oh, the yield curve inverted. That's a sure, sure signal, 100%, uh, you know, sure bet that, that the market is going to crash uh, very soon. It is actually a light week for, uh, for any expected market news. Uh, we do have uh, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, coming out next week. That's on the 12th, but, uh, but this week we won't get a whole lot. We will get the, uh, the Federal, Federal Reserve releasing its notes, its meeting minutes uh, from the last meeting. It's going to release its meeting minutes on Wednesday. That's going to be pretty important because not only is it going to show us okay, you know, what the Fed members were saying about increasing interest rates, but also uh, about their plans to shrink that $9 trillion balance sheet. Okay, Again, folks, what the, what the Fed does, one of its policy tools to stimulate the economy is it buys bonds, all right? It buys treasuries, it buys uh, mortgage-backed securities, mortgage-backed bonds and stuff like that. You know, so, so obviously what is it doing there? It's buying those bonds, uh, it's buying those fixed income investments, securities to put on its balance sheet and it pays cash with those. It, it basically pays, uh, you know, pushes money out into the economy. That's how it grew from $4 trillion balance sheet back in uh, you know 2018 uh, to $9 trillion right now, right? So it's added about $5 trillion to the economy by, by buying those bonds. Now it's going to start talking about, okay, you know what? We don't need to be juicing the economy anymore. Um, in fact, we want to pull it back a little bit to, to kill inflation. Um, so they're going to, they're, instead of reinvesting those bonds every time they mature, uh, you know, pushing more money out into the economy, they're going to stop doing that. So it's, it's kind of a steady stream of cash that has been going out into the economy to stimulate the economy, pushes asset prices up. Uh, pushes stock prices up, that's not going to be happening uh, anymore. So investors are just going to be watching for how quickly they're going to be doing that, how quickly they're going to let that balance sheet shrink and really you know, stop pushing so much money out into the economy. So that's going to be very important on uh, Wednesday. Uh, again, uh, on that CPI number, the Consumer Price Index uh, next week on the 12th, that could be shockingly bad. And this is something that I'm really watching closely. Uh, it's gonna, probably going to be double digit consumer price inflation, uh, you know, so 10%, 10% or higher even, uh, because that's going uh, to include the gas price increase that we saw last, uh, last month. It's not really going to include some of the grain prices and agricultural prices that we've been seeing. Uh, the, the increase on those after the Ukraine invasion, but, uh, but those are going to start going into uh, inflation as well. So inflation is about to get worse, not better. So be, definitely be watching the, uh, for that. Uh, we do get some, some positive, uh, positive sentiment here in earnings coming up. Okay, so first quarter earnings are going to start coming out uh, here, not this week, but probably about mid-month. First quarter earnings for companies will start being reported. Analysts are only expecting about a 4.7% increase in uh, in earnings for S&P 500 companies. Uh, you know, over the last year, from you know to to the first quarter, uh, I think that's a little pessimistic. You know, after we've had about five plus five quarters of 20% plus growth, uh, I think 4.7% as an estimate is very conservative. I think it goes you know at least five and a half six percent earnings growth. So uh, so I do think you know we get we get a little bit of uh, market sentiment from there, of course. You know, and supportive of stocks, of course, a lot of it is going to be uh, what management says about uh, the rest of the year, what management for these companies says about the rest of the year going forward. As we've seen over the past few weeks, you know, management uh, management has been trying to guide those expectations lower uh, by saying by, by giving negative outlooks for the rest of the year for their companies. Uh, that's been driving share prices down. And, and of course, you know, it's only so they can beat those expectations later in the year so they can say, hey, you know what, uh, we did so much better than, uh, than we thought or so much better than the market expected. Pay us more money, right? That's that's just the game that management and Wall Street plays every single quarter. Um, so we'll, we'll have to be watching for that. You know how that hits stocks uh, coming up over the next couple of weeks of those first quarter earnings. All told, though, it is it is still an optimistic market. Okay, uh, we still are in that rally mode after the Fed rate hikes uh, increased. So uh, so so I would not be jumping out of the market. You know, just because of some of the news news you see or uh, you know some of the potential for 
you know, for weakness. I do want to look at some of the stocks this week, uh, some of the stocks reporting earnings and what I'm watching. One is, uh, you know, it's Constellation Brands reports earnings on uh, Thursday, I believe. Uh, shares are down about seven and a half percent so far this year. Now, Constellation Brands, obviously a uh, you know liquor, alcoholic beverages, uh, alcoholic beverages place or company owns Corona. You know, also owns a thirty nine percent stake, thirty nine percent ownership in cannabis company Canopy Growth C, ticker CGC. Uh, so I think if we see some strength coming back or some investors coming back into the marijuana stocks, that's obviously a, a big boost to this company. Um, but you know, for uh, for the earnings uh, being released on Thursday, sales growth has remained positive over the last several quarters. Uh, but the market is really, again, really going to want to see what management says about inflation. Okay, particularly uh, the the price of barley. Okay, over the last few weeks, with that Ukraine invasion, uh, the price of barley has just gone through the roof. Right, uh, Ukraine and Russia are both big bar big barley exporters, uh, and obviously that's a that's a big component in uh, your beer. So, uh, so investors are going to be watching for what Constellation, what management at Constellation Brands says about that. If they think they can keep their, uh, you know, their margins, their profitability higher, uh, shares for Constellation are traded right, right around 5.1 times on a price to sales basis, which it is cheaper than 6.6 .6 times on Diageo, which is another uh, liquor maker. Uh, but it's well under the 2.3 times price to sales on Anheuser Busch. So not not expensive, but not nearly as cheap as uh, maybe some of its competitors. So I'd be watching uh, that on Thursday. You know, it's uh, it, it it is down seven and a half percent so far this year. Really, right around uh, what the market has done. Uh, I don't expect it to move a whole lot on those earnings, just because uh, you know I do expect some kind of a some kind of a negative outlook on those uh, on those barley prices and what that's going to do for costs. Conagra Brands. Conagra is uh, something we've talked about here on the channel before. Uh, you know, uh, food consumer staples company, uh, food packaging and, and processing, uh, also reports earnings on Thursday, and I I think this is a good chance to surprise on the upside. Okay, competitor General Mills, so ticker GIS reported its quarter ending uh, February 27th recently, and had pretty generally positive news, right? <clears throat> So General Mills upgraded its 2022 guidance on uh, price increases and really good consumer spending. So we could hear that again from ConAgra Brands if, if we hear kind of some of the same things. Uh, now, ConAgra did miss its earnings last quarter by uh, by four cents a share, which was a pretty big miss and pretty rare for the company. So maybe an earnings beat here uh, this quarter would, would actually uh, turn that sentiment around. So I like ConAgra Brands here. It's a uh, you know it's not cheap, but it's uh, it's not uh, it's it's a it's a decent long-term stock. It pays a 3.7% dividend yield, so that's pretty darn good for a lot of these consumer staples companies. Next stock I'm watching here is SoFi Technologies. It's uh, up one percent so far before the market opens. Uh, actually, one of my largest stock holdings. I think I've got uh, I think somewhere around twenty five, thirty thousand dollars in SoFi Technologies. Is really you know the uh, it's this is the this is the video I did last uh, last Friday. Okay, really highlighting these seven stocks that I'm investing in. SoFi, one of the best, I think, is really positioned to be the fintech, the online financial leader uh, of the future, and actually has a pretty strong catalyst coming up. You know, the uh, student loans have uh, been been deferred for about almost two years, really. Okay, so if you had a federal student loan, you didn't have to make payments on it over the last two years because of the pandemic. That expires in May. Okay, and what you got to understand here is even though SoFi has moved on, has evolved into uh, really a full service financial online financial company, it still gets a lot of its revenue. It's still very much a student loan payments uh, company, which is, is how it started. It started out as a student loan servicer, student loan uh, refinancing company. So it still has quite a bit of its, uh, you know, of its business in student loans. And the fact that nobody's been paying those student loans and there hasn't been quite that much demand for student loans over the past couple of years has really, uh, you know, has really acted to weigh on the stock market, on the stock shares. So uh, as I said, that moratorium on student loans ends in May. We're expecting some kind of news any day now on uh, you know, President Biden to either extend that or to say that no, he will not extend the student loan moratorium. 
Honestly, folks, you, you know, I, I mean, hell, I've got student loans. I still got $60,000 in student loans that I've been slow paying for the past 20 years just because the interest rate is is so low. The interest rate on my student loans is 2.7%, right? So why am I going to fast? Why am I going to pay those off if I don't have to? So I've been slow paying those. Uh, but I even I understand, okay, you know what, there is no reason people can't be paying their student loans right now. Okay, it is two years into the into the pandemic, jobs, unemployment is down at historic lows, you do not have an excuse not to be paying your student loan payments. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just how it is. There's no reason this needs to be extended beyond May. Uh, and that could be very good news for SoFi, okay, because they're going to get back to their business as usual, you know, being able to refinance and collect on some of these student loan uh, payments, things like that. So I think that's a, that's going to be a positive catalyst for the company and could send uh, shares uh, higher on that. <clears throat> so I do want to uh, I do want to look at uh, some some other things here. One of the something else, uh, kind of a new thing with the uh, live streams we're going to do each week, kind of looking at uh, some of the some of the past blog posts on the blog. Uh, a lot of you didn't know I had a blog. I have a blog. It's called My Stock Market Basics. It's really going back to kind of some of the basic things, uh, you know, about the stock market. Really trying to get beyond, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the technical terms and jargon that you see on the news and on YouTube. Really get back to the basics in stocks. Uh, this this article or this video that I did about uh, about two years ago, actually one of the most popular on the blog. How many shares of stock to to make a thousand dollars a month? And I loved doing this video. It was really uh, looking at some of the some of the most popular stocks and how much you would need to make $1,000 just in those dividends each month. So we had Walt Disney, we had Realty Income, Ford, Apple, even AT&T was in there. You know, how much would you need to invest each month uh, or invest how many shares to buy to make that $1,000 a month? And we talked about, you know, what that means, uh, how, to, how to create a dividend from the shares as well as from some option strategies. So check that out. I'll leave a link to, uh, to that article to that blog article in the description below. Check that out, some of the other uh, blog posts on the blog there. Want to look at uh, cryptocurrency because uh, we could be getting another catalyst uh, in cryptocurrency pretty soon as well. Uh, as we said, crypto Bitcoin is now up 25% from its March lows uh, and uh, and actually up in positive territory for this year, right? It's outperforming the S&P 500, outperforming stocks, and uh, we could see some, some very positive movement. Okay, so uh, if you don't know, then the uh, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is tasked with approving exchange traded funds. Right, uh, you know, a fund provider will go to the SEC, say what it wants to do in an ETF, uh, and the the SEC has to uh, approve it before it can go onto the market. The SEC has been just just uh, you know dragging its feet on any kind of a Bitcoin spot fund. Okay, we have futures funds, so we have ETFs that trade you know, uh, off of the Bitcoin futures market, but we do not have one that trades off Bitcoin itself. And the SEC has just been dragging its feet, denying everything. Kathy Wood over at ARK Invest just got her ETF application denied last week. Uh, and this grayscale, this grayscale uh, GBTC, okay, this is the, uh, this, this is the massive uh, Bitcoin trust, the grayscale Bitcoin trust that is probably about as old as, as any of them. Uh, 5.6 billion dollars. It has been trying to convert to an ETF from that trust structure for years, and the SEC has just kept on denying applications. It's slow, slow going all the applications. Uh, this fund is actually trading about 20% under the market value price of the Bitcoin it holds. Okay, so this grayscale, grayscale Bitcoin trust. Full disclosure: I do own shares of this GBTC um, because it is uh, it, it does have such a, a huge catalyst for for upside. I think. Um, so what this trust does, it holds Bitcoin, okay, in a reserve account to cover, you know, the uh, the investments uh, and the the trust shares in this. Uh, those that Bitcoin is valued at right around seven billion dollars, okay. Now you see here the market cap of those trust shares only five point six billion. The reason why that is is the way a trust is set up, uh, as far as redemption of shares and that kind of thing. They typically, a lot of times, they'll typically trade at a discount to the net asset value in those. Well, what does this mean? As I said, this Grayscale Bitcoin Trust has been trying to convert to a spot ETF for years. And it's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when. They will eventually convert this into an ETF. When that happens uh, and it trades as a regular ETF, 
that asset it's going to trade with its asset value okay the 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 value of the market cap of this of this uh of this ETF then is going to be at that asset value of 7 billion dollars right which is a 20% upside from here now they've actually have a an application in with the SEC and how this is how this is interesting is they have made uh, you know they have made headlines recently saying that you know what if the SEC does not approve this application they're going to sue the SEC uh, they're going to uh, sue the, the SEC has been hiding behind investor the, you know the excuse of investor protection for years on, on these Bitcoin ETFs right which is bullshit because you know we've had spot ETFs for Bitcoin trading in Canada for years and there's no, been no problems with market manipulation or investor protections anything like that. The SEC just, you know, Chair Gensler over the SEC just doesn't like Bitcoin and doesn't, you know, doesn't want to approve a an ETF. So Grayscale is now saying, "Okay, well, you know what? We're going to take you to court for not uh, for not protecting investors' interests and in constantly denying these applications." So now that uh, you know that threat of of legal action against the SEC probably not uh, not enough to really force a, a, an approval of an FE, a, a, of an ETF you know so i'm not saying that, that we have an imminent ETF uh, approval for bitcoin coming but it will force movement on the issue okay they're going to go to court they're going to fight it in court and that's going to force you know the SEC to to really prove its case that uh, investor protections uh, aren't there for ETFs and that kind of thing. Okay, so we are going to see some actual movement, uh, you know, on this issue rather than the last two years where the SEC just denies applications left and right. So that is uh, that is going to be some uh, some good news for for that. Also, want to uh, want to look at uh, the housing market. We've got some real time market monitoring, some signals from the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, that's that's really just proving what we've all what anybody looking for a house actually already knows about the housing market. Okay, looking at housing prices over the last couple of years, here's a chart, and this uh, again, this is the uh, this is the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, right? The research division there at the Fed Bank of Dallas uh, studied real housing prices. So real housing prices is adjusted for inflation. Uh, <clears throat> And what you see here, this bottom line here, let me expand this a little bit so you can see this. Uh, this this bottom chart here with the red dashed line, that is a 95% confidence in upper bound. Okay, that's that is where that's where the Fed is saying, okay, in their research, this is a 95% confidence of a housing market bubble. Okay, so think about what that means. Look at that just entered one here. It's only done that twice. Twice over the past 40 years, it is a housing prices. And the momentum of housing prices has beaten that, uh, has moved beyond that red dashed line, right? Of course, we saw that back in uh, about 1999. We saw it just very briefly in 2018. And again, this year, it has moved back in there. Uh, so housing prices are in a bubble. According to this uh, real house price exuberance uh, factor by the Fed. Now, a couple things here. One is don't expect house prices to come down anytime soon. Okay, you can see here, it uh, it moved past that confidence interval, that 95% uh, pro probability interval right there of a, of a housing bubble back in 1999. And we all know, you know, housing prices kept on going for, uh, for several years, all the way to 2006, 2007, before housing prices started coming down. So even though housing prices are expensive, it is a bubble. A bubble right now doesn't mean uh, that housing prices are going to crash anytime soon. You know, beyond that, uh, you also have to see that real house, real interest rates. Okay, everybody's talking about how uh, interest rates are so high that they're causing houses to be un unaffordable uh, for a lot of people. Well, the problem with this is. The, because inflation is so much higher, where we've got seven, eight percent annual inflation right now, uh, real interest rates are actually negative. Okay, so think about this: if you uh, if you take out a loan for a hundred dollars, uh, you know, and, and you've got even a five percent uh, mortgage on that loan in a year, you'll have, you'll owe about one hundred and five dollars, right? That's five percent interest on a hundred dollar loan, but if inflation is at 8% and let me just show you that show you the math here cuz it's it's actually you know pretty simple pretty simple back of the envelope math here you take out that $100 loan in a year you owe you owe $105 right because of that $5 interest rate but inflation is 
You know, so the dollar is only worth 92% of what it was last year, right? So what you actually owe is only $96.60. Okay, so even though even though interest rates are very high, the real cost of borrowing money is still low. Okay, so that's one reason why you're not you're not necessarily going to see a um, and this goes into what we'll talk about the yield curve later. You're not necessarily going to see a stock price crash or a housing price crash because the cost of borrowing is still very low uh, compared to uh, compared to what it has been in the past, even as interest rates go up. So I do want to uh, I do want to talk about uh, you know that yield curve uh, because this is something that that we've been seeing in the news lately. Everybody's uh, chicken little crying that the stocks are falling, the sky is falling because the yield curve is inverting. So I want to talk about this why it's not necessarily the case that we will get any kind of a uh, any kind of a stock market crash and or a recession. And if we do, it's going to be you know it's going to be more than a year uh, in the future. All right. So let's look at this. Uh, what does the yield curve actually mean? You know, why why does it usually mean uh, mean a recession is coming? Things like that. Okay, so first of all, the yield curve is just kind of this visual representation, this visual graph of the interest rates at different maturities for for income for treasuries, right? You know, for for interest rates. Okay, so you've got the government issuing treasuries, one month treasuries, two month, three months, two years, all the way up to thirty years here, right? Now, because obviously, because if I'm going to lock my money up for 30 years versus maybe just two years, I'm going to want a higher interest rate on those 30-year treasuries or on those 30-year bonds uh, than I would have to take for a two years, right? So typically, this yield curve, you know, this the interest rates across these uh, across these time periods, typically it goes up, it slopes up like that, right? Because you get uh, you get people that just want to stop sack their money away for three months or six months. You know, they just want it safe. They don't care too much about interest rates on that money. So they're going to accept a lower interest rate. If somebody's going to sock their money away for 30 years, though, they're going to want a much higher interest rate, right? So if the economy is go going smoothly, you're going to see a pretty natural uh, upward sloping on this yield curve. Now, what we see here is obviously, uh, okay, so because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, because the Fed is pushing up interest rates at the low end, right? It pushes up its federal funds rate, which is the rate that banks uh, the banks borrow from each other. They use, it's pushing those rates up at the lower end of the curve, right here, right around here uh, at the low end. It's pushing those rates up. Well, the market sees this and says, okay, you know what? Interest rates are going up. We're getting a little worried that the cost of borrowing uh, is going to is going to be more expensive, and that's going to slow down the economy, right? If the Fed if the Fed goes too far on raising interest rates, that's going to slow down the economy, and that's going to and what that does is it brings interest rates down over this longer period, over this 10 to 20 to 30 years. Those interest rates kind of hold steady, or they even come down a little bit. So what you see is the interest rates at the low end of the curve going up. And the interest rates at the high end coming down, and that's that tends to flatten out the yield curve. Okay, you get a flat yield curve like this. Now, in the past, uh, and they've actually got the uh, the the chart here. In the past, so this is this is yield curve inversion. Okay, every time every time this little this blue line here comes under the black the black line of zero, that's when the yield curve inverted. Okay, and you can see that you know a lot of times that has happened before these shaded recession areas. Okay, this goes back to uh, about 1975, uh, the shaded areas. So we've got six recessions there since 19, uh, 1975, 1980. Uh, and, and you can see that, you know, the, the yield curve has inverted uh, often before those. Now, you can also see that it's given some false signals here. Okay, the yield curve inverted there in 1998. We didn't have a, a recession. It inverted again uh, here in about late 1999. And, and eventually we did have a recession. Um, a couple of things you want to understand here. One is why is that this happening? Again, the market is getting worried that long-term interest rates or those rising interest rates is going to hurt economic growth, and that's eventually going to lead to a recession. The key word here, though, is eventually. Okay, if you look at this chart, you know you can see that uh, typically the yield curve inverts years before a recession. Okay, the, the yield curve inverted in 1998. Okay, it was or, or 1988 here. It was years before that that recession in 1990. Uh, again, it, it inverted in 1998. Okay, again, it was years before stocks fell and before that recession. Here in 2000 and, uh, 2006, the yield curve inverted, uh, and again, it was several years before before stocks fell. In fact, it has been an average of 22 months. 
after the yield curve inverted before we had a, an actual recession. And I want to look at what stocks actually did because, you know, obviously stocks aren't a, aren't a recession and stocks can fall before we have a, an actual recession. But if you look here at the data as well, okay, we, the, we've got four instances here where the yield curve inverted. You've got 88, 98, 2005, and then 2019. Now I think I would throw out this uh, this this 2019 inversion uh, because we really don't know what happened, uh, you know what would have happened to stocks in 2020 if not for the pandemic. Okay, so it's really kind of you know that uh, it really wasn't an economic stock market crash; it was that pandemic led crash. Uh, but you look at those these other three, okay, 88, 98, and 2005 when the yield curve inverted, it was 20 months. 20 plus months, 19, 22, 21.4 months until the stock market peaked after that inversion. Okay, so if you if you heard off of YouTube or some of these financial news sites that oh my God the yield curve is inverting, it's the a recession is imminent. Get out now, folks. Then you would have been waiting for 20 months, for almost two years before uh, as stocks continued to go higher uh, before they actually reached its peak, and you would have lost out on look at this 33 percent, 39, 24 percent uh, of of gains, potential returns uh, that you would have missed out on because you jumped out when the when the yield curve inverted. And again, of course, you know, if you missed out on those gains, you get here the 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 sad tragedy here again is that so many investors they panic because they hear some YouTuber talking about the yield curve and, and they they get out of stocks. They go two years missing out on these huge returns, 20, 30, almost 40% returns. Uh, and then after about 20 months, they say, well, shit, maybe I was wrong. I need to get back in the market and start making some money. So they get in the market then. And by then, you know, it's too late. By then the market does peak and uh, starts coming down and, and they're just ass out of luck, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they market time, completely opposite market timing right there. So again, folks, I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to, to jump out of this market just because you know you, you hear on YouTube or uh, or some financial news site says the yield curve is inverting or interest rates are growing up, and that is a clear signal of some kind of a recession because it's not. You know, uh, it is a recession someday. But again, what you need to be watching for is here is when the Fed stops those interest rate hikes, when it says, when it's pausing, when it's saying, okay, now we're worried about the economy, that's when you can start to get worried. And typically that is, you know, a year, a year into the interest rate hikes before, uh, you know, before they even start getting worried and start, start pausing those, those rate hikes, okay? So I want to turn it over to uh, the question and answer part of the uh, of the live stream. The part I love the uh, love the most. Love connecting you with the, with you out there in the community. Great community uh, as always. Um, I want to uh, I want to scroll back up here and see what questions we have. If I don't see your question, uh, go ahead and ask it again with a uh, with a question mark. So I know it's a question. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy says a last day to buy AT and T before Warner Brothers Discovery Media spinoff. Okay, so uh, talking about Warner Brothers, talking about AT and T, uh, you know they are going to spin off their their Time Warner part, and and you know everybody watching the channel over the last couple of months, I have gotten bullish on AT and T. I uh, was bearish. I, I hated the company, hated the stock for so long uh, because of that strategy of just gobbling up everything they could and paying using debt to pay for it. Uh, it really, really hurt the company and hurt their focus. Now they are coming back onto that telecom focus. Okay, AT and T is going to be just a telecom company. Okay, they they spun off their they sold off their Direct TV uh, you know investment. Now they're spinning off their Time Warner investment to to Warner Discovery, uh, and uh, and it's just going to be a telecom company. Okay, so. It's not going to make you rich, you know. I think AT and T shares should be worth about thirty dollars a share plus that four and a half five percent dividend. Uh, whereas it's going to be after the spinoff. Uh, so, but a very stable cash flow company. Okay, they're going to be they're going to start making money off this five G that they've been investing in over the last couple of years. They're going to start making money off of that one. It's going to be very stable, very strong cash flows on that. Now, you will if you own AT and T today or before uh, before that spinoff, you will get shares of this new Warner Discovery Media company. I'm not so not so bullish on that. I, you know, in fairness, I haven't looked very closely at that. But just at that higher level of those streaming companies, entertainment media companies, 
it is a very tough environment, okay? If you're not Netflix or uh, Disney Plus or Disney, right? Then it is very competitive, okay? And even for those two, uh, they, these, these media companies, these streaming companies, they are having to pay you know, tens of billions of dollars to create all this content, create these shows and all that. Uh, and, and consumers just have so many choices, okay? As far as streaming providers or streaming services, okay? So it is, it is very expensive. Margins are going to be extremely low. Now, I do like Discovery. I think they have a, a little bit of competitive advantage in some of their content and their programming because, you know, it's mostly that reality TV uh, documentary type stuff, uh, you know, on Discovery and the home and health uh, networks and that kind of thing. So it's a little bit cheaper to, to produce than some of this other content, this other streaming content. But the Time Warner stuff, that's the traditional, uh, a little bit more traditional content uh, and a little bit harder, you know, a little bit more expensive to, uh, to produce. So, you know, I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily hold on to those shares. Uh, I'll probably just sell my shares once I get them in my account uh, and just hold those shares of AT&T instead. Okay, what else we got? Uh, we got Lifters Gym in the house. Lifters Gym, a longtime citizen of the Bowtie Nation. Good to see you here. Ivan, good to see you there, there in, the, uh, in the chat. What else? Uh, I mean, because I don't want to buy bonds. Okay, what else? I'm just trying to look for uh, more, more questions in here. Was there a beloved bullfoot? I'm adopting. Uh, so Danny, Danny says I'm adopting Joe as my rich dad. Awesome. You know, I I would rather have a rich dad myself. A uh, rich dad adopt me, but hey, I'll, I'll be your I'll be your rich dad there. Okay, I, I learned more from about economics from Joe than my college professor in 10 minutes. Nice, sweet, uh, because we don't know. <clears throat> what else do I use? Where did you go? Uh, t -t 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 looking for what kind of moats do you look for in companies? I believe I heard Warren Buffett mention. Okay, so, so Ultra Rex wants to know about moats, okay? Uh, and this is kind of a term used by, you know, Morningstar uses this a lot. Warren Buffett uses this a lot. So what we talk, what people talk about when they say moats is an economic moat or a competitive moat for a company. And really, if you think about it, that's, you know, that protective little lake or, or a ring around a castle, right? In medieval times, they had that moat, those moats that protected them from, uh, you know, from invaders, right? So what we talk about when we talk about companies and stocks is a moat is uh, you know some kind of a competitive advantage, some kind of an advantage or or protection that protects them from competition from uh, you know other companies, right? So so if a company has just you know really great customer service or has a, a very innovative product or very sticky customers, right? Sticky customers is you know customers that have high exit costs. So you know if it's if it's very hard, really hard to switch that service. Uh, if you have to, you know, if you go to another competitor, you got to set everything up and it's, it's expensive and it takes a lot of time. That is a, that is a competitive moat, uh, you know, because the customers are going to tend to stick with that, with that business. Okay. So, so it's really those qualitative factors that you look for in a company that makes it a best of breed company, right? Because, you know, they have customers that stick around, they have a competitive advantage in their marketing or customer service or uh, you know, or things like that, or the way they distribute their uh, their products. Okay, so it's a little bit little bit harder to measure than a lot of uh, you know a lot of other things we talk about. Those some of those fundamental factors. What you can uh, you know what you can kind of get indirectly about these uh, these looking for those moats in companies, and this is a very very important uh, lesson in fundamental analysis. Is when you look at like a sales growth, sales growth for a company versus its competitors versus its peers, does it have higher, faster sales growth than its peers? Okay, is it taking some of that market share from its peers? Okay, because obviously, you know, if if you got five companies selling the same product or in the same industry, if one, you know, if if all these other four are growing at, you know, we'll say five percent a year, growing sales at about five percent to maybe ten percent a year, or whatever, uh, and then you've got one that's growing at like fifteen percent a year. Um, and then obviously the overall market for this product probably growing right around five or ten percent a year. Why is this one growing at fifteen percent? Well, it's got some kind of extra advantage. You know, it is taking market share away from these other companies, right? If uh, you know, if customers are only increasing their their purchase of this product by maybe about five percent a year overall across all of these companies, 
if one is growing at 15 percent it's obviously taking some of that market share from some of these others okay so how is it able to take that market share why is it able to grow uh, sales faster than all the other companies and that's you know that's some kind of an indication of that competitive moat of that competitive advantage that it's able to do that you also want to look at some of those margins those profitability margins that we talk about here on the channel you know you'd look at the gross margin you look at the operating margin okay and and we don't have uh, we won't go deep too deep into those because I, I do it quite a bit in the in the video so watch some of the videos look at look search for some of the videos on operating margin but basically again <clears throat> if you compare the profitability of one company against its competitors you've got those five companies if four of the companies are all operating at an operating profitability an operating margin and again that's just the operating income divided by the sales okay it's how much of sales after paying their suppliers after paying production costs after paying wages marketing all those operating expenses things like that how much of sales is left over for that profitability that operating income okay the operating profitability okay if if you got five four of these companies operating at a 10 percent operating margin right 10 percent operating profitability and one company again is like 20 percent or something or 15 or 20 percent why is it able to produce so much more efficiently so much more cost effectively than these others that is an indication of this moat of that competitive advantage that's what you want to look for <clears throat> And that's what a lot of, you know, that's what Warren Buffett is looking for when he's looking for these companies. He's looking for companies that are managed very well. He's looking for companies that have this, this kind of competitive advantage, you know, uh, signaled by in, these, in some of these fundamental factors. So you don't necessarily have to dig into a company's, uh, you know, financial reports and, and really look at, okay, what is their product? What is their customer service? You really don't have to do that deep, deep qualitative, uh, qualitative analysis. You just kind of have to look for some of these some of these signals in its numbers that kind of signal that kind of a competitive advantage or, or a moat. So that's what I look for a lot of times when I'm trying to find that kind of best of breed stock is, is sales growth, uh, operating margin, you know, and I'm doing it, I'm doing it versus other competitors versus com companies selling that same product or, or service. Okay. Uh, very important to, to compare it directly against its, its competitors. <clears throat> Stream on another channel at once. Chances are your video feed on your second scene just needs to be restarted. Okay. Uh, Morning peeps. So I'm still uh, still looking here if I own converted ETF. Okay. So Red wants to know if I own GBTC. So we talked about the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, the ticker GBTC earlier, how it's going to be converting to an ETF or eventually wants to convert to an ETF. Red wants to know if I if I own that trust, the GBTC. And it converts. Will I own the ETF? Yes. You know, you will. When it converts into an ETF, you will be directly, uh, directly transferred into those ETF shares. So no worry there. You're going to see the price jump on that because again, it's going to trade from that trust discount into uh, an ETF into its net asset value, uh, which is one th one reason I bought the shares. You know, I bought the shares when it was trading right around here at a 20% discount to that. Uh, to that market value, to that net asset value. Uh, so as soon as it converts into a truck, into an ETF, you're going to see a 20% bump in those shares back up into that, uh, you know, into that ETF. Uh, so, so very, very strong, very strong one. I uh, go back to where he is. This market's overvalued. Please. <clears throat> okay, gonna buy. What else do we have here? It's like Chipotle. Thanks for the input. What do you think about Polestar? Really don't haven't haven't looked at Polestar. Uh, sorry, can't can't really tell you much about that one. Thoughts on Twitter? Elon has nine percent. Yes, big news today. Uh, Danny says thoughts on Twitter. Elon purchased nine percent. Big big news today out today is that Elon Musk has taken a nine point two percent stake in Twitter. So he own, he now owns about 9.2% of the company. He's not an activist investor. He's not uh, he's a passive investor. So he's not pushing for any changes at Twitter. Uh, he's just basically just wants a, a share of the company. So it's a pretty big chunk. Uh, Twitter is uh, what about $30 billion company. So he's actually got about a $3 billion investment in Twitter. Uh, not not sure it says really says anything about it. Uh, I'm not sure that you know, Elon Musk could or Tesla could buy Twitter and do anything with it? Uh, you, you know, I mean, it doesn't really doesn't really fit with the production side of the business. So I, I you know, 
I don't see how it would benefit either Tesla or Twitter to uh, to merge the companies or do anything. It's just uh, just obviously a sign that uh, you know he thinks the company is undervalued. Uh, he thinks you know the service is doing something uh, something really well, and, and he's investing in the shares. Uh, so Twitter's about Twitter's up something like twenty percent today uh, on that news. Uh, you know, I would, I, I mean. I would have to look at the valuation. I, I especially after this twenty percent jump, I wouldn't be jumping in the shares. You know, after a twenty percent pop in the share price, uh, it's probably taken it to a, a little bit more expensive than I want to pay for it. Especially since Twitter has had problems with monetization in the past. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't make quite as much money off of its uh, off of its users as maybe a Facebook or some of these other social sites, right? So, and that's why you get a little bit lower valuation on shares of Twitter. Um, and, and again, after this 20% pop today, I, I think it probably takes it beyond, you know, that, uh, that kind of the, the, the fair value of the, uh, of the stock. Okay. <clears throat> what else? Uh, Michael, Michael, uh, $5 super chat. I appreciate that. Any opinion on VYGVF? Uh, I have no idea. I use solid interest rates. Uh, solid interest rates, easy plus the company is the second highest revenues year over year, but four states just opened and cease and desist. Uh, honestly, you know, I mean, I can, we can go over to the, uh, to the, to the thing here. YGV. I, I don't even know what the company is. Uh, v, Jesus, VG, VYGVF. Okay. I mean, I could tell you already VYG. VF. This is already a pink sheet company. Okay, so what what does that mean? Voyager Digital. It's a pink sheet company. Nine hundred million. A nine hundred million market cap. So it's actually a, a fairly large company uh, to be trading on the pink sheets on the over the counter, which is kind of surprising. You know, most of these stocks are are, are pretty are quite a bit lower. Five hundred million or less. Uh, by the time they get to a, a billion dollars, they're usually trading on the Nasdaq or, or whatever. Uh, but you know these these pink sheet companies, these OTC companies, you they do not have the kind of regulatory oversight or the financial requirements. So you really need to be looking into the financial statements. You cannot trust uh, a, a lot of what you see or hear about these companies in, in the news. A lot of press releases, things like that, are put out by the company itself. Um, so you really have to be looking into, you know, directly into the uh, into the financial statements itself. You really have to do a lot of analysis on these because it just isn't uh, doesn't have the kind of oversight, you know, it that, that these other companies do. Um, you know, again, I can't I can't tell you anything about this company. I don't know what it does. Uh, software applications, you know, which is obviously a growth field, operates as a crypto asset brokerage firm. Okay, so so it's a it's a digital platform for cryptocurrency. Uh, like a Coinbase, like some of these others, I would be I would be cautious there. Okay, I would be cautious on this just because the uh, same reason I'm cautious on uh, shares of Coinbase, on a lot of these other ones. Okay, I don't know the valuation on on Voyager here. I haven't looked at it, but what I'm worried about with these crypto digital platforms, right, is Okay, all of their revenue, all, all of their money is based on these trading fees with cryptocurrency. Okay, uh, so one. One is cryptocurrency has to do well for these digital platforms to do well. Okay, if crypto, if Bitcoin and all these coins don't keep on going up in price, investors are going to lose interest. They're not going to be trading on a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these digital platforms. Okay, so uh, so you might as well be in directly in the cryptocurrencies themselves. Okay, because if they're going to do well, then these digital platforms are going to going to do okay. The problem is, though, there are a lot of these digital platforms. And just because crypto does well doesn't mean any particular, any individual platform is going to do well also. Okay, you've got Voyager Di Digital here competing with Binance, competing with Coinbase, competing with a lot of these other big, uh, big platforms. And the problem is, you know, uh, as those as those trading fees, as the fees to trade cryptocurrency come down, which they will, they will come down just like they've come down for stocks down to zero. Uh, then you get these digital platforms that have to diversify their revenue. They need, you know, this this company, Coinbase. They need other assets or other products, other services to keep on making money as that trading fee for uh, for crypto comes down. You know, so. So I'm not 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 a big fan of the the digital platforms. I do think Coinbase, you know, Coinbase has that size, the scale to really survive and, and co compete in these other products. I know they're trying to put together an NFT product, uh, some of these other things that is going to take the take the impetus, take the 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 pressure 
off of those trading fees for crypto. So Coinbase would be a, a better a better choice here, I think. Uh, Voyager Digital, I think I, I actually do think uh, did this one did this one come to market through a SPAC or something, uh, which again is another red flag for me, uh, just because these SPACs, these uh, special purpose acquisition companies, have been so overvalued over the last couple of years. So you know, I, I mean, I, I just I would be very cautious about this company unless you unless you've looked into the financials and you really like something like this. I would be cautious and really probably go with something else on on that. What else? Uh, some Berkshire Hathaway. Sewerat. Love that. Love the name. Sewerat wants to know about uh, thoughts on Berkshire Hathaway A and B stock. Uh, not sure what you what you what you mean by you know uh, the difference uh, between A and B stock uh, is really just just the price. It's the exact same company and they both track perfectly. So if you don't want to buy Berkshire Hathaway A, you buy Berkshire Hathaway B for a little bit less, and it's basically the same stock. You know, uh, thoughts on Berkshire Hathaway in itself, the company, uh, you know, I mean, it's hard to argue with that kind of performance. If you do look at the stock versus the S&P 500 or versus the NASDAQ, it has underperformed over the last couple of years. So, you know, as growth stocks uh, really, really got boosted during the, uh, you know, over the last five, 10 years, because of lower interest rates, because of higher economic growth, growth stocks did well. Berkshire, excuse me, Berkshire Hathaway actually uh, underperformed the market. Um, now, if value stocks and what typically uh, you know Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire Hathaway invest in, if those value stocks start start outperforming, then uh, you know that that stock might might perform uh, once again. You know, if you're looking for a stock that is just a good, I mean, basically Berkshire Hathaway is like an ETF, right? Uh, I understand it's like an exchange traded fund, okay? Because Berkshire Hathaway they own you know they own several businesses outright. They own uh, railway railways, they own insurance companies, uh, but then they also have a stock portfolio of about I think it's about 50, 54 companies, right? That they have in that stock portfolio. Um, so it is it is like an ETF with you know, 50 to 60 stocks in it, okay? And all these stocks are value cash flow stocks, right? So if you're looking for basically a value ETF, a value and dividends ETF, then then it's not a bad deal, okay? It's not a bad uh, it's not a bad stock. So so you know if you're looking for something like that, invest in that. Uh, you know I would compare it against some of these other value or dividend ETFs to see how it performs and and which you like because basically it, like I said it is an ETF uh, at this point. <clears throat> when you when you uh, Doctor Next asks when do I expect fintech stocks to recover? Uh, you know I, I mean the recovery started two weeks ago. Uh, I think fintech stocks, okay, those financial technology stocks, and we'll we'll say the the larger growth stock, uh, you know, universe, all those growth stocks that that did so well over the last couple of years, uh, a lot of those obviously got hit hard uh, starting in probably about February or March of last year, uh, and have really accelerated those losses this year. Uh, started rebounding a couple of weeks ago. I think they I think they continue to do well. Uh, all you that are watching the channel know that uh, I've started investing in some of those growth stocks. Uh, check out that video from last Friday, the seven stocks that I'm investing in. Probably about four of those uh, are, are growth stocks. You've got Teladoc in there. You've got uh, SoFi Technologies. You've even got PayPal in there. Uh, a lot of those stocks that were just ridiculous valuations last year uh, that, that you know I wouldn't touch uh, I now started investing in those, uh, you know, beginning of this year because the valuations are lower. And you know, for these folks, you got to understand this is a different mindset than uh, some of the some of the other stocks. Maybe you buy, you buy, I mean, you buy stocks, you buy stocks like Coca Cola or Pepsi or uh, you know some of those some of those very or AT and T those stable cash flow companies. You buy those for cash flow. You buy them for safety, stability, things like that. Okay. Uh, you don't do that with these growth stocks. You buy those for the future, okay? The, you you cannot buy SoFi Technologies, Teladoc, PayPal even. You cannot buy those and expect just a slow and steady, nice, nice stress-free, uh, you know, chart to, to go up, okay? You can't do it. Those those stocks are going to be a roller coaster. You got to understand that. But if you look at these companies, and this is really where you really got to do your homework, you got to look for those that very few handful of companies, five to ten companies at the most, that you really think are changing the world in which we live in, that have that competitive advantage on the future, uh, on the future of their industry, uh, of that side of the market, and that are going to be going to be those ten-year stocks. Okay, I know it was easy over the last couple of years. You bought shares of Ark Invest, the, the Ark K, or you bought shares of Teladoc or Zoom Communications, and you just saw the stock go go up that way. 
uh, you know, you, you saw a hundred percent return and it was easy. It's made, made investing easy, right? That's not how investing works. I'm sorry. It's just not, uh, okay. This is how investing works. You, you pick companies, you know, you pick companies, uh, for the safety, for dividends, for cash flow. those that's fine. Or you pick companies for the future and you be ready for that stock volatility because it's going to happen, but you stay in those companies, you stay in those stocks and they're going to go higher. Okay. You got shares, it's companies like Teladoc, right? We covered that in Friday's video. One of my favorite stocks, one of my largest positions. And, and yeah, really, you know, I, I mean, they're they're forecasting revenue of four, $4 billion by 2024, okay? From about 2.6 billion this year. Okay, that's about a 30% year over year growth. Uh, and this stock is trading for about four times on a price to sales. A ridiculously low uh, price to sales valuation for that kind of growth, okay? doesn't mean the stock is going to keep start going back, start going exponential like it did over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, but it's still going to be rocky. It's still going to be a roller coaster, but you got to believe in that story. You got to understand that story and, and really invest for that. So these fintech stocks, you know, you ask me, if you ask me when I think the rebound is going to happen, you know, set a date on it. So, hey, buy now because these stocks are going to the moon. That's just not how you invest in these types of stocks. Okay. If you're going to invest in these types of stocks, you need to understand how to invest, why you're investing, and, and that you have to have that long-term that long term outlook in them. Uh, yeah, I know it sucks. It sucks that you're not going to make 100% on your money each year, uh, okay? But 30% uh, a year annualized return is pretty damn good, you know? And if you can get that, even if you can get 20% or 15% annualized return on your money by holding it out, by waiting it out for these really good quality growth stocks, uh, that's still a pretty damn good return, and I think you're gonna you're gonna do well. So can't necessarily say okay right now fintech is gonna take off again like it did, uh, but but I can say over the next ten years you pick some of these good fintech companies, biotech, uh, these strong growth stocks, uh, you know, uh, internet names, things like that, and they will do well over the next ten years. Okay, uh, Michael. Michael has a, a target price for ET. Uh, Energy transfer covered this on the channel before uh, ET. I've liked it. It's a it's an MLP uh, and it's, it's just done huge. It's done really well over the past uh, few weeks as those energy prices ran higher. Uh, but like you know, like a lot of these oil stocks, like a lot of these energy stocks, it has just gone. It has gone so far so fast that that I would be kind of cautious now. With energy transfer, I think, you know, I, I think this is one of the energy stocks. I, I still own energy transfer. It's a smaller position, but I still own energy transfer. Uh, but it's not necessarily for, you know, the year-to-year the -year returns or, or to sell out a, on a price target, things like that. Uh, I mean, yeah, okay, that is weird that my, my picture is not showing in the, uh, the lower right corner here, but uh, I guess I'm a ghost here. Uh, anyway. You know, but but shares of energy transfer, even after that, uh, you know, even after that strong run to 11.50 a share, they're still paying a six percent dividend yield. Okay, so folks, you know, if you're looking for a strong cash flow company, six percent dividend yield is still very strong. Uh, I would say it's probably touching uh, up along the uh, the upper, you know, the upper boundaries of of fair value here. Uh, so if you're looking at some kind of hedging strategies like selling calls against it or something like that, you know, I mean, now might not be a bad time to do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I would just hold on. This is one of the stocks that, that I just hold on. It's in a retirement. Por no, actually, this one is not in a retirement portfolio because it's an M MLP. You don't put your MLPs in retirement portfolios because you lose a lot of the, the tax, uh, the tax consequences on MLPs. Uh, <clears throat> But you, uh, you know, you, you just hold on to it and you collect that six percent a year. Uh, it's gonna do, it's gonna do very well, especially at least for the next, you know, three to five years while we're still tied to oil and tied to those oil pipelines and things like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't necessarily say that I have a, a target price where I would sell it because uh, it is, it's just a long-term cash flow stock for me uh, that uh, that I know will will continue to grow, grow its asset value and, and grow its share price as well as as well as that dividend. <clears throat> So what else do we have here? Uh, uh, vampire. I have no idea what that means. Uh, Sam wants to know why Teladoc. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, look, watch the Friday's video. 
Okay, it's I go into detail on all seven, all those seven stocks that I've got two hundred fifty thousand dollars in just seven stocks here in my portfolio. Uh, I've, I own other stocks, but these are by far the largest positions in my portfolio. Teladoc is is one of the first that I highlight. Uh, I go way w into way more detail than I can here. Okay, Teladoc, it's it's the future of healthcare. Okay, virtual healthcare is the future. Uh, it's not going to replace all your doctor's visits, but it will replace quite a few. Uh, it's much more efficient, much more practical than than having to get my ass in the car just to go to the doctor every time I need to get a checkup and, and things like that. So Teladoc, you know, is sales growth growing 30% a year, very good valuations here. And, and it is one of the, the, the strongest growth stocks out there, I think. So so watch that, watch Friday's video, because it's going to outline really the case uh, case for, for that. Uh, <clears throat> what else? When, when should I sell ET and MRO? Both are related to oil industry. Okay, you know, I, I mean, related to uh, to that question on energy transfer, Jamie wants to know when should I sell ET and MRO? Uh, related MRO is up 500% in my portfolio. ET is up 60%. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, th that's that's the thing here. I, I, you got to understand. Uh, I'm not much of a. I'm not really a stock trader, so I'm not going to tell you to to sell right now. You know, because these are expensive. Uh, I think at best, at most, maybe you sell some covered calls on them. Okay, because like again, like I said, like we opened the uh, the live stream, oil is expensive here. It's way more expensive than it should be, uh, if not for the Ukraine situation. Uh, so I do believe oil comes down. If we don't get any kind of an escalation, then oil comes down to you know eighty five, ninety dollars a barrel at the most. And you do see some some give back on some of these oil stocks, right? I want to keep them in my portfolio though because they are cash flow machines. Okay, even even at eighty dollars a barrel, even at seventy five dollars a barrel, a lot of these energy companies or oil companies are are operating at about a fifty dollar. 40 or $50 break even rate on oil, right? So what does that tell me? That tells me oil can come down a lot and they're still gonna, still gonna be making a lot of money, okay? They're not exploring quite as much as they used to. They're not reinvesting a lot of that money into capital expenditures, things like that. So they've got just cash flow coming out their ass and they're returning it through share buybacks and through dividends. Okay, so I want to keep the shares. Uh, if I'm worried about the share price coming down a little bit and those short-term returns, you know, then maybe I'll sell some covered calls against those shares. I've done that a little bit with some of my Chevron uh, shares, so I've sold covered calls to another investor uh, for for those. You know, if you're looking at that, you know, maybe you take a covered call with a strike price that's like maybe 10 or 15% higher than what it is now. Now, So that still gives you about 15% upside on the shares. You can still collect that. You collect that money from the covered calls. Okay. And we've got videos on uh, how to do a covered call strategy, you know, on the, uh, on the channel. <clears throat> Let me think about uh, BBL. Let's see if I can knife. Okay. Uh, just uh, just going through these, looking for, uh, uh, do, okay, Cameron wants to know if I hold Palantir. Actually, I do not. You know, Palantir is is actually, it's a, uh, I, I actually had shares very briefly, uh, right, right about when Kathy Woods was selling out of Palantir completely. I bought shares uh, because, and I actually did a video on this. I bought some shares of Palantir because it was just the point of max fear in those shares. Okay, Kathy Wood, who had been the biggest cheerleader for the company and, and held billions of shares, was then selling out of the company, giving up. Uh, and it was really the, the point of max fear in those shares. This was, uh, I think, about three weeks ago or something like that. So I did buy some shares in that. Uh, I took a really good, uh, really good, good rally uh, rebound in the shares. I'm, I, I still don't like the shares as far as uh, valuation. I mean, these shares, Palantir is still trading for, uh, and we can look it up here, but Palantir is still trading for a very high price to sales ratio, much higher than I generally buy in at. Uh, <clears throat> so if we just look at the uh, the Yahoo, uh, look at the Yahoo statistics real quick here, Palantir <clears throat> still trading for, 17.7 times on a price to sales basis. Okay, so all you out there in the nation watching the channel, you know, my cutoff really usually is, is about 10 times on that price to sales basis. Okay, even for these growth stocks, even for these stocks that are growing their revenue by 20, 30, 40% a year and more, uh, you know, very strong revenue growth, but I'm just not going to bite. Okay, this is the same thing that saved me from a lot of the growth stocks last year that were trading at 20 and 30 times on a price to sales basis, even though they were growing, even though everyone was buying those stocks. Uh, I just, I, I will not buy a company if it's uh, price to sales is over about 10 times uh, on that ratio. So I did, you know, I did get in 
get into the shares just briefly uh, for that for that real quick trade. You know, after Kathy Wood so sold out, I ended up selling my shares. I took in that quick quick profit because because you know, I mean, yes, this company could be the company of the future. They're doing some big things with uh, data data uh, analysis. They've got a lot of great government contracts, uh, and it's a growing company. But I'm not paying 17, 18, 18 times sales for this company. Okay, I'm not paying 17, 18 times sales for any company. Okay, it's just um, I'm a cheap ass, and I can't get my cheap ass to pay that much for a stock. Um, so that's that's one that's the reason why I really I don't own shares of Palantir anymore. If you are that long term investor that that you know doesn't worry too much about paying uh, how much you're paying for for stocks. Um, then, then I mean that's something to look at. You know, if you really believe in the company, the company's growth, its message, uh, where it's going to be at in ten years, maybe you do that. You know, I will say I was wrong about Tesla and Amazon, two of the biggest stocks that I've been wrong about. Uh, you know, all those years trading at you know, ungodly price to sales ratios. Okay, Amazon is now quite a bit lower than ten, uh, but for many many years it was well over ten times price to sales, uh, well over on those uh, those er price to earnings uh, basis. And I just could never take bring myself to, to buy shares. Um, you know, really the only two companies I, I, I can think of that haven't proven that rule of uh, you know some kind of some kind of discipline in price to sales ratio uh, because you know obviously they've just kept on going up. Um, but for most for the most part, these companies that are trading at 15, 20, 30 times on a price to sales basis, you got to be careful for them uh, about them because any kind of hit to investor sentiment, any kind of hit to the market, it's going to bring those down pretty hard. Uh, and that's what we've seen in most of these growth stocks over the last year is is trading those huge price to sales ratios. They've now come down to four and five times on a price to sales basis. So so definitely be uh, be watching for that. <clears throat> Okay, what uh, do you think Marine Max good moat in the sector? Okay, <clears throat> have a good moat in the sector. Okay, so Nelson wants to know about Marine Max. This is a this is actually a stock that we covered uh, in the past. It's a uh, it's a, a speedboat or or water Marine Max. It's a uh, it's a, a water recreation company. I guess we'll call it HZO. You know, and, and I mean, I think the the consumer spending is is strong enough on this that uh, you know I think it I think it does have a good moat. I, I think it does have a good competitive advantage against some of these other uh, you know some of these other stocks in it. Uh, the stock price has pretty much gone nowhere, gone uh, has since since fallen down uh, lately. Look at the statistics here. Let's look at what it's trading for. Okay, trading for price to sales of just 0.5 times. Okay, so you know, and, and enterprise to revenue of just 0.5 times. So this is it's a very good value stock. Okay, trading for enterprise to value, enterprise value to revenue of half, you know, 0.5 times, which means you know, uh, 979 million market cap, one billion dollar, uh, one billion dollar enterprise value, which means it's got a lot of cash. It's probably got a lot of cash, a little debt. Okay, so 216 million cash. So it's almost cash positive on the company. A retail company with that much cash is uh, is pretty rare. So you know, I mean, I, I like the company. I like I like that general trend in uh, you know consumer spending towards this you know towards recreation and leisure. People are getting out more. They're getting outside, uh, and, and I think that's good for for the sales for this company. What else we got? <clears throat> drive while we twit. Uh, CCA Palantir, if you love the company. IVR. Do you like any Emreits? Okay, James. James wants to know about Emreits. Those are mortgage REITs. Uh, now you've got to watch out here for these because these are one of the few sectors, one of the few industries that really gets hit by by inflation and rising interest rates. Okay, mortgage REITs. Basically, these companies they uh, they borrow short term rates, so they they'll borrow at maybe like two or three month uh, rates, uh, you know, periods, uh, and then use that money, leverage that money three, four, five times that money. Okay, so they'll borrow, you know, maybe they borrow 200 million and they'll leverage it five times to a billion dollars to buy mortgages, right? Well, what happens is, uh, you know, as inflation kind of eats away at the uh, the value of those mortgages, as interest rates go up and, and that mortgage portfolio decreases in value, then these these are the ones that get hit the hardest, okay? In that inflation, in interest rates, things like that. You know, like we we talked about, stocks usually go up when interest when the Fed is hiking interest rates, uh, when inflation is maybe a little bit higher. Mortgage rates are sometimes the exception to that, okay? Now, that said, I do like uh, some of these, uh, you know, uh, AG&C, 
agency is one of the uh, you know one of the ones I do like in this. And and for these stocks, you got to understand again, you know, these stocks that's more of that long-term cash flow hold. Okay, you buy it for the dividend, you buy it for that long-term stability. We're always going to have mortgage companies, so mortgage REITs. Okay, um, so even if the price comes down a little bit on this on the stock on these shares, the then you just hold on. You keep that. You keep that dividend. The dividend is going to continue to flow, and eventually the stock price is going to come up, and that's when you sell. Okay, you do not sell. You don't sell when the stock price is lower, uh, because it will eventually come up. The economy will, will eventually change in the favor of these mortgage rates, and uh, you know, and, and you'll be able to to book that return on the share price as well as all the dividends you've collected. So you know, some of those I, I do like. Uh, I do like AGNC Chimera uh, is is another one. I think that's. Uh, that's like C, uh, CIM is the ticker on that one. AGNC, of course, is the ticker for AGNC investment. Uh, so those two are pretty good, uh, pretty good mortgage REITs. Uh, I think Two Harbors is another one, uh, another example of those. Okay, uh, what else? The new limit is a potential for stocks like Enron. <laughs> okay, Ahmed. Ahmed uh, says he's new to investing. Is there potential for stocks like Enron happening in today's stock market? You know, folks, I mean, you know, Enron can happen anytime. Okay, any individual company, uh, you know, and there's two things here: just outright fraud, which is what Enron was doing, and fraud, and, and you know, under the table kind of stuff that, that they were doing. And then there's uh, you know that overall market market collapse. Okay, and so you know you can get fraud at any company anytime. Okay, and you really there's really no way of telling when it's going to come or where it's going to come. Okay, so and that's why you just need you need more than one stock in your portfolio. Okay, you need at least eight to fifteen really good companies in your portfolio, along with some exchange traded funds. Okay, this is the core satellite strategy that I talk about so much on the channel, uh, so much that in fact that a lot of you are probably tired of hearing about it. But that core satellite strategy of owning three to five exchange traded funds, holding a lot of your money in there, and then getting those extra returns with that ten or maybe fifteen individual stocks. Okay, that way, you know, you got 15 individual stocks, maybe about three to 5% in each. Uh, uh, you're not you're not worried about any one company just completely folding like Enron, because it's only a 3% hit to your portfolio if it does, but you can get that opportunity for a little bit higher returns on the overall portfolio. Okay, so very important that that you diversify outside of, you know, any one any one company. So what else? Uh, Okay, well, we are we are heading on uh, an hour and a half into the live stream. I'm going to cut it off at this point. If I didn't get to your question, please ask it in the comments below, and, and I'll try to check that out later on when, when I'm at the gym and, and handling comments and that kind of thing. You can, all, you can always tell the days I go to the gym. It's usually about five or six days a week because I'll answer comments uh, you know, while I'm between sets and, and stuff like that. But uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us for another live stream. I will see you in the next video.